so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, um, our faculty member today, John Wyatt. Um, amongst uh, many things, John is a professor of management science and engineering. Uh, he's the director of the Energy Modeling Forum and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy, which is the institute I work for. His specialization is in energy and environmental policy analysis and strategic planning. He has had a very broad influence during his career, including being an active advisor to the United Nations, the European Commission, the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of State, and the Environmental Protection Agency. In California, he's been an advisor to the California Air Resources Board, the California Energy Commission, and the California Public Utilities Commission. John was honored in 2007 as a major contributor to the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Quite an honor. And John's overall goal is to accelerate the use of systems models at all levels, state, um, federal, et cetera, to provide the best available information and insights to government and private sector decision makers uh, so that we can move forward in the best ways possible. And in my experience, John is a warm, curious, and caring person. And with that, I give you Great. John. Thank you for, uh, Wahila, thank you for that very gracious uh, inter introduction. And uh, I actually um, feel most uh, pleased that you added that last part, because I think that's important. I'm known as somebody who recruits grad students and employees uh, based as much on character as technical skills. You guys all have such awesome technical skills. I think for the kind of work we do, it's, uh, it's good to be a good team guy. I'm also a philosophical devotee of the great American philosoph philosopher, the late coach John Wooden, if you know that. So I, can, I could spend the whole time giving you John Wooden quotes, but I won't do that today. So I'm gonna try to uh, share my screen I'll try to go on. Uh, so uh, as Rahila mentioned, uh, my longest standing role, which I've done uh, probably half my time for the last uh, 30 plus years is to direct the Energy Modeling Forum. I will uh, probably not talk about that explicitly, but show you some results from some recent and uh, pump prime uh, your interest by talking about some uh, ongoing and upcoming studies. Uh, I have done several roles for the Precourt Institute for Energy. I helped Jim Sweeney as deputy director run the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center during its uh, 12 or 13 year um, existence. Most recently, and to put in a plug, I am the faculty coordinator of the Stanford Energy Seminar. You should have gotten a flyer uh, regarding our program for fall quarter or will shortly get that. So moving on, um, I know I don't. I only have a 50-minute slot, so I'm going to try to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, but I often babble on endlessly, so I'm going to greatly economize my normal uh, talk, which is on energy, environmental systems analysis, and policy. I'm going to spend just a few minutes giving a little background on me, a background on modeling, because of the kind of work I do. I uh, reflect often on why are we doing all this stuff in the first place. Uh, I've renewed my interest in same in the fake news era, if I could call it that. Uh, I don't want to get too political in this talk. I am not really um, here to teach you how to be an advocate. There are better people to do that. I'm here to uh, talk to you about uh, what you might want to do in terms of uh, developing your systems analysis tools that could help you be a advocate on either side uh, of whatever your favorite divide is. Uh, but mo mostly uh, my uh, objective is to try to provide uh, neutral information to all parties. So I'll go through the first three items in about three or four minutes. And then I'm gonna focus my talk just to give you a flavor for the kind of work we have been doing, uh, are doing and will do in the future on some basic concepts that we have found useful historically. Some of these for some of you will seem old school, but I will uh, quickly go through some fairly recent examples and then uh, dive into the directions for future research, which hopefully uh, some of you 
will get actively involved in uh, and or will choose to do so in your time here at Stanford. Um, in terms of, as what Hila said, my, my general interest since uh, my uh, college essays in high school, which was a few decades ago, maybe four or five by now, uh, is to use analytic methods, use my skills in math and uh, physics or something to help solve big problems. Uh, I focused mostly in what we call in the MS&E department, my home department, policy and strategy domains. I, uh, my parents um, accused me of trying to stay in college as long as possible. I started at, at a little bit too late to be a star in the uh, space, or a major player, I should say, in the space program and uh, aeronautical engineering and astronautics. I went into uh, engineering management, operations, research, and statistics. And then my PhD is actually in management science from a small uh, public university across the Bay. I was apropos of the ms &E curriculum, our, our uh, coverage. I did a uh, minor in economics with a uh, master's degree equivalent uh, organization theory and finance at that point. I then did a um, postdoc in public policy and political economy at a um, the uh, Stanford of the East uh, in the Boston area and along the way did uh, four years of summer internships and then the Rand Corporation paid for my um, dissertation effectively, interestingly, on uh, synthetic fuels. And uh, the uh, my thesis was on public policy R&D priorities in ener uh, energy R&D energy uh, policies. Uh, and uh, my RAN spinoff was, should the US Air Force uh, have any interest in uh, synthetic fuels at that point? Uh, they were thought to be produced not from uh, biofuel sources, but from uh, shale oil, as it was then called, and coal, if you can believe that. So uh, just, just quickly uh, kind of do what I was mostly focused on during my um, somewhat lengthy career now. I was really focused in the, from high school through uh, the end of graduate school and a bit beyond on the Cold War, national security, race to space. Uh, and then my RAN group, interestingly, got into air and, air and water quality. I did a, a air quality model in LA, where RAND is, interestingly. By the time I got here, I then morphed that uh, um, into uh, work on energy security, the acid rain problem. Uh, I then uh, developed, uh, partly because I had been in a business school for part of my gra uh, graduate um, work on corporate strategy. We could talk the whole talk about that, but I won't. And then I would say now I focus mostly on climate change, as Wahila had said in my introduction at the international country and state levels. Also, I've gotten more interested in not just the mitigation policy, reducing emissions, but also in multi-sector, multi-region, multi-stressor dynamics, which is part and parcel of, you know, extreme uh, weather events like hurricanes and uh, droughts and more recently uh, wildfires. I have kept a um, playthrough stream uh, through all these interest areas in technology and innovation, uh, policy and uncertainty analysis. I would say I am probably a uh, somewhat balanced, but uh, if you wanted to, uh, label me with a bias. I'm kind of a technology optimist. I think that goes back to the 60s, whereas a probably junior high schooler, I thought Kennedy was nuts to announce we were going to land on the moon in that decade, and we did. So uh, the next question, just to wrap up this preamble, is uh, just to get you to think a little bit more broadly. I think often we all, you know, students, faculty, get kind of into the middle of a debate and lose track of what the heck we're trying to do in the first place. So the question is, why do we build these analytic tools to help us make decisions? Uh, we need uh, insights and numbers for policy development. Uh, it's easy to decide what to do based on political philosophy, or um, uh, it's easy to see that now, uh, or uh, kind of religious beliefs, I guess I would, uh, I would say. So, but at some point, uh, people are interested because the problems are so massive, there's so much uncertainty and so complicated. A little bit of data and analysis goes a long way. I won't take the cheap shot on the COVID um, epidemiology, but I, you could easily do that, uh, probably better than I could, because you're more directly affected by it. I'm just uh, hanging out at home right now. So uh, what are the advantages of modeling? We sometimes forget the easy ones, like providing consistency and the different thoughts we have about how the systems of issue are evolving and what we can do about them. We try to learn insights, uh, robustness about 
what policies seem more robust uh, across a wide range of uh, uncertainties and contingencies. Um, we struggle uh, in interdisciplinary work with uh, what principles do we use? Do we use disciplinary principles, which sometimes are inconsistent within, uh, but certainly uh, in between uh, disciplines? Uh, what do we mean by empirical evidence? You see in the COVID debate, a lot to talk about science as if data is science, it's probably not science and as if the data is all perfect, which as we see every day in the uh, evening news, it's uh, not quite so perfect. Uh, and then I wouldn't spend a lot of time uh, here, but I do spend a lot of time in real life working with the global uh, modeling community on uh, issues like how should uh, models be evaluated to get them uh, people thinking that they are more credible. And uh, first and for foremost, uh, who decides all these things? Is it the disciplines themselves, the national academies, the lawyers, uh, more often than we might like, or us? I like the us as long as it's you guys and uh, related uh, people. So back to the storyline here, I'm going to quickly go through seven um, basic systems modeling concepts that I have been useful uh, uh, through the years. The first uh, couple uh, things I did, in, even in my thesis that have now evolved a lot, the middle of the list are things that I did early in my uh, career here in the, in the bottom, um, with the exception of the very bottom one, are things that uh, I am doing now and hope to do more in the future. Uh, the first one um, is a way to compare different energy technologies in terms of their cost and environmental performance. This is on the cost side. Uh, there's this uh, uh, concept called the levelized cost of energy or the levelized cost of electricity. So this is a static view. Pick a place, pick a technology, try to add together the fuel cost, the operating cost, and then the tricky part is the capital cost, the cost to build a facility that you're using to generate the uh, electricity stay and uh, the 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 uh, that that's the hard part because those facilities don't last just one year so if you want to do per kilowatt hour you kind of have to amortize if i could use that uh, finance accounting term uh the the usefulness and life of the facility over the its full lifetime so you could think of a simplistic way of doing that and say well this uh, power plant be it nuclear or solar lasts 30 years, 50 years, let's just take that cost and divide it. Uh, some of you who are business school, um, business oriented know that you probably, the right way to do this is to assume that you're borrowing the money. So either you're borrowing it from lenders or from your own uh, retained earnings or own uh, profits. And you should take into account the uh, financial time value of money that you could have invested that in something else. So you get a, a capital recovery factor, so-called, that boosts that capital cost component a bit above um, what you would get by just dividing by the number of years. This is an old diagram just for, for uh, this I did at the beginning of the Global Climate and Energy Project uh, on a project that Jim Sweeney and, uh, were, and I were involved in. And, um, constructing the original GSAP portfolio, working for Leonor and Chris Edwards, who were then the directors of GSAP. Uh, I don't have my full story on this, which was an animation which took solar PV and working with the solar research teams here, uh, mostly in material science and chemi. I had an animation that said, here's where we are in solar. Our group thinks we can, um, by 20, 20 or so, which is this year, uh, reduced that cost by a factor of 10. I did an update on this for the Pre-Court Advisory Council about four or five years ago, and the group, uh, we were reunited, and the group said, well, now we think a factor of 10 is too wimpy, we're going to go another 50%. So lots of changes. This unfortunately also is uh, at a time in our history where natural gas prices were pretty high. So the cost for solar PV in particular, a little bit less for solar thermal, have come down quite substantially, but we have had a fuel cost reduction because of the shale gas uh, boom, but now we're seeing in many regions uh, solar PV can compete with uh, not just nuclear and coal, but also natural gas in not every region, but some regions. This has led, uh, fast forwarding into later on in the talk, a uh, issue of grid integration. So I think on the margin, we can expect to see what we've seen in the last five to 10 years, uh, dramatic increases in solar PV, wind, and to some extent, solar thermal, because you can store 
uh, in thermal form, uh, the uh, generation for longer periods of time. But the Bits and Watts initiative here, um, alongside the, uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, ma material science-based uh, battery uh, initiative, have uh, been working on uh, better ways to do grid integration. Uh, one link to what's coming up is uh, Part of that problem is you have so much solar PV now, or will soon have it, that you have this duck curve effect where you get too much uh, solar generation, say in California midday, you can't even use it all. And then by the time the sun goes down, you're running really short. And given the dynamics of operating the power system, that's the big problem. So you need batteries or what's called demand response incentives for people to uh, use more electricity in midday and less at the uh, end of the uh, end of the day. So uh, moving on, and this uh, that so that concept I actually used in my dissertation many moons ago uh, was then observed by a group of people. I won't go through the litany uh, that you could put together these uh, pictures of levelized cost in a spatial and uh, temporal diagram of how the energy system evolves using mostly uh, principles from physics, physics and thermodynamics thermodynamics that uh, kind of trace the possibilities as you go from resources in the ground or in the air through various conversion processes is a big one in the US and elsewhere is converting those fuels into um, electricity to satisfy various end uses. The big dogs in the US are obviously uh, in the challenges right now. We still use a lot of coal for electric generation and a lot of oil for transportation processes. So to get into the ms &E part of this, we, we have a whole group that does optimization in various stripes now. You could think of uh, putting together an energy systems model where the objective is to minimize the cost of uh, operating the uh, system, including uh, the fact that you might increase costs slash prices to reduce demand. You don't wanna leave that as a freebie. You wanna kind of weight that into the calculus you use and you have constraints on satisfying energy demands uh, only using the available resources. So satisfy demands only use available resources and convert energy forms at efficiencies of the available technologies. A big challenge right now is how will these technologies evolve in the near and uh, long term and alongside that how fast will the new technologies even though one could argue they are superior actually get used and adopted in the marketplace i think we need our business school colleagues to both analyze that problem and put together business plans including finance and marketing to accelerate that so as i said you you can run a uh, energy system model to calculate the uh, reduction in total system cost including the welfare loss from reduced demand and use that calculation to sketch out what's called a marginal cost of emissions call, uh, uh, controller or a marginal abatement cost. So here I have the level of carbon dioxide emissions and if you don't tax, you, uh, you don't pay anything uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, the more tightly you constrain it, the faster it goes up. In recent years, we've seen this curve tilt down substantially, probably not despite what some people would like to believe uh, down to completely zero or negative, although that would be nice and uh, people are still working on that. Uh, the problem with doing this solution, which is a low cost solution is we probably incur a lot of climate damages. So I'll spend a few minutes on uh, where, we've, uh, where we are. Uh, we have many experts here on campus on this side of the ball, the marginal cost of climate impacts. Uh, there are four basic ways that people have used in IPCC reports and national climate assessments and the modeling community. And those are structural models that take phys physical and economic uh, inputs into a uh, structured process oriented model of a particular sector in a particular region. Cross-sectional statistical models that look at variations, say temperature and precipitation in agriculture across different regions and try to tease out kind of common uh, technology and uh, pr uh, crop choice uh, and adaptation choices like irrigation across different regions. I wouldn't say anything about travel cost models and continued valuations. These are ways to evaluate impacts that are not um, producing market information that one could use in a statistical or econometric approach. There are three types of um, ways uh, 
uh, to evaluate agricultural impacts uh, apropos of the last slide, the st straight statistical approach, a pro process approach, or a hybrid approach, a signature article in the uh, uh, 2009 and uh, the uh, proceedings of the National Academy for the first time um, uh, showed results that had not seen before. They basically said, suppose yield growth is a nonlinear function of heat, uh, so that log yield can be represented this way, kind of uh, the typical uh, tricks the smart ec econometric econometricians use to do these cross-sectional analyses with uh, a time invariant country, country fixed effects to make a long story short, for the first time, despite the fact that earlier econometric work said there isn't much effect, a very slow decline in, in uh, major grain categories, corn, soybeans, and cotton. Um, there is only a, uh, a very gradual effect. They saw breakpoints. Uh, part of it was focusing on the extremes in the temperature dis distribution. Another uh, fact was they uh, had data that was uh, now uh, aggregated at the county level as opposed to the state level or big bigger regions within the US. So this uh, so-called uh, Schrenker Roberts paper was signature our own David Lobel in uh, uh, Earth System Science of the School of Earth has uh, worked with them. In fact, I've, uh, through one of my projects, sponsored uh, a comprehensive follow-on to this work, which I'll give a little bit of uh, intro into in a second. Uh, the other way to go about this, besides this more aggregated statistical approach, where you essentially put a few physical values in with the typical economic uh, drivers and outputs in terms of uh, effects on crop, productivity, so-called, is to do a, de a detailed physiological uh, uh, model. Um, we have the whole bio uh, eco community at Stanford that does leaf photosynthesis, canopy photosynthesis, crop growth, development, and yield. Here you look at soil conditions, soil moisture, much more uh, intensively on uh, both carbon balance, but also importantly, nitrogen balance and probably phosphorus by these days. Chris Field, uh, our uh, head of the Woods Institute here is a signature and has done many uh, CO2 fertilization and other nutrient fertilization experiments at Jasper Ridge. So you put all that science together in a detailed process model. Uh, the same Slinker Roberts now working with David Lobel, who I've already set up, actually said, well, is a statistical model or a process model better? As is usually the case, um, the uh, Combination of the two, which they art, artfully put together, does better than each one individually. I don't have time to really justify that with historical data. This is a projection that shows what one might expect for a two, to, two degree C rise and a 20% uh, rise in rainfall. Obviously, a uh, bigger fear is where you also have decreases in, in rainfall. Uh, so this uh, fast forward to a special issue that one of my projects sponsored with this group and many others tried to do a multi-model, multi-model um, uh, uh, methodology uh, uh, comparison. Uh, as David had predicted, up to one degree, the, the results from the statistical and process models are quite similar. And then you see a breakpoint. You see uh, Harvaging back to the uh, Slinker and Roberts, you see these breakpoints, which some people call tipping points now in the climate debate. So that's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. It makes me less sanguine about saying, oh, these, these will be slow, gradual, as opposed to more uh, aggressive uh, ones. Concept five is uh, to put the economic calculations that I showed in the energy systems diagram, which are basically Partial equilibrium, we only consider one sector, the energy sector, and the cost of doing that, and that it gets traded off against uh, aggregate uh, reactions in the rest of the economy to break it down into uh, multi-sectors, uh, energy and non-energy, and then reformulate the objective function to be overall consumer utility or welfare in that a uh, way you can uh, both look at structural changes in the economy as it affects energy demand and solutions that seek to change the structure of the economy as well as the energy technologies per se as a remedy for things like climate change and even traditional air pollution. A uh, little footnote here to set up the next slide. Uh, you can also, at the level of consumer utility, trade off consumer choices between consumption and savings which affects the amount of investment you make, which has a long tail of benefits. So the Ramsey rule 
uh, means you trade off your immediate gratification from direct consumption, or you take your productive output and invest it in capital equipment, which has a small but long-lived increment to future production possibilities. You can also put leisure time in here to get a full picture of uh, consumer welfare. Uh, concept six is over the years we've learned uh, often the hard way that these more stylized uh, perfect market uh, equilibrium or optimization models leave out important things like consumers and people investing in energy technologies uh, don't have microprocess in their brains or Stanford degrees. So uh, having promoted energy efficiency in my dissertation, I learned the hard way that you couldn't just do the analysis and expect the man on the street, Main Street, to immediately do what you say, uh, that you needed to help them uh, understand what those uh, more detailed studies were saying. They weren't about to invest half their available time in learning the data and, and how to put it together to make their own decisions. We learned that uh, uh, not only energy, but water and land markets are far from perfect. We have high uh, degrees of regulation still in many states in the US with regulatory agencies uh, preventing a kind of least cost, uh, so-called efficient standard. We've also learned the hard way, COVID makes this even more obvious that there are multiple objectives for decision makers across uh, both energy environment and the economy. But uh, again, we see now in bold relief equity, uh, energy access, uh, energy poverty, and more generally sustainability issues where often the least, the most disadvantaged people uh, among us are put in a, a non-sustainable state uh, in support of us, uh, I'll use the term elites, I think you know what I mean by that, achieving our uh, climate and other uh, objectives. Uh, so one of my favorite ways uh, I now use in my classes, in fact, to go from this more um, kind of mechanical uh, first economic and operations research principle point at which I started and even the engineering principles is a, uh, thing that uh, Pam Matson and colleagues have put into a book based on 20 years of research on a sustainability science approach. The reason I like this is you see the normal uh, economic way, which I've already laid out of thinking about this problem where you have capital assets and you uh, engage in productive processes to produce goods and services and then you consume them. They immediately say, oh no, but that is an interesting place to start, but we all have uh, objectives that have multi dimensions to them on the one hand. And number two, in addition to the normal economic model, which focuses on manufactured capital, as I just described it, with a little slide of hand, uh, we also have a need to keep an eye on human capital. What are the abilities of our citizens through education and training to do things, natural capital, the ability of our unmanaged ecosystems often to provide vital uh, services for us as a society uh, and knowledge capital, which is basically IP, knowledge about how to do things differently or better. Uh, those uh, subjects have been studied by economists in, um, in more narrow studies, but not brought into the larger models. And my personal favorite is social capital, which says, do you really have the ability given the existing organization of human activity through markets or rule-based uh, allocations to actually deliver the goods that you see coming out of these more narrow models. So there is a book on this I highly recommend. The final concept, uh, which I'll go all the way through the application, uh, was actually done, believe it or not, in the 1990s in a book called Buying Greenhouse Insurance, published in 1992, that says, really, climate change is a risk problem. It's not uh, what we expect to do. Uh, it's what we fear could be coming up in the tails of the distributions, if I could use that term. So uh, then I've done a little bit of a stylized thing. Suppose you took that normal distribution around possible outcomes across the climate sensitivity, which is the uh, amount of temperature change per uh, doubling of CO2, which is a key statistic from the climate models, and the damage function, which is per uh, two degree warming, uh, what would the reduction in uh, GDP be? And basically truncate it, take the tail off uh, of that center, uh, kind of do the uh, mo uh, mean of that tail and then do the mean of the rest of the distribution, which is kind of like an expected value 
decision maker might do. And then look at two cases. One is what we've normally done historically is uh, clairvoyance, meaning we learn the true state of the climate system now and in the future immediately, and we act accordingly, as opposed to we're really flying blind uh, for a number of decades about what the climate sensitivity and the damage functions actually are. To make a long story short, we see a couple of interesting things in this kind of a stylized picture. We do see uh, even in the optimistic or expected value case, we do, uh, we do get an indication in a cost benefit sense of substantial emission reductions. Um, we do see if we're, we already know we're in the uh, more dire scenario for sure, we would immediately reduce emissions. Where we're, we're kind of moving closer to that now, as you see in the news every day. But more importantly, in the uh, risk management case, we see that uh, the optimal strategy, given that we don't know the, uh, what the future will bring on either the mitigation or adaptation side or damage side, uh, the, the, what's indicated is some hedging, if I can use the borrow up term from finance. Uh, I, I did real options in finance. And in fact, the hedging is nonlinear. So this is more than 10% of the way from the happy face scenario to the more dire scenario. So that is something I'll come back to at the end of this talk. So I'll now in a few minutes go through some applications. Uh, cost benefit analysis, I've already given the full introduction. I just display, these are a little bit dated. Uh, Bill Nordhaus is, I'll come back to him in a second. Uh, playing off of a two degree target against a uh, baseline scenario uh, against a uh, two times CO2 uh, uh, historical pre-industrial CO2 emissions and his optimal, which was then 3.4. It's actually a little bit under three now, which isn't too far from two, but far enough to stimulate some debate. I wish we were doing this optimal scenario now, but we're not at the global scale. Here are the car corresponding uh, prices. I will uh, remind you, uh, probably my oldest and most uh, productive non-Stanford colleague, Bill Durthouse, actually did win the Nobel Prize in economics not the Peace Prize as I was involved in for integrated climate science into long run macroeconomic analysis. I welcome questions on that. In our EMF studies, which he draws on to aggregate the marginal abatement cost he uses in, our, in his model, um, we actually have done uh, a sequence of studies on US climate policy. I'm gonna do US and then uh, uh, global. Uh, we've looked at these kind of efficient policies using either a, a uniform carbon uh, or CO2 tax, CO2 equivalent tax, or a cap and trade system. We can trace out through many scenarios a uh, what the economists call an efficient frontier. Interestingly, we don't seem to be able to do those policies in the U.S. now, uh, historically or now and probably in the future. So an interesting thing to look at is the uh, kind of specific policies and measures that do seem to get more salience at all levels from local to state to national and global, uh, regulations on fuel efficiency standards for automobiles, uh, uh, re restricting coal use. The, this particular scenario bans new coal pa power plants with a renewable portfolio standard, uh, combining the two, the Steve Chu, Jeff Bingaman, Wrinkle, which was a clean energy standard, which was like an RPS, but you give small credits for nuclear and solar. Uh, interestingly, we see these are all over the place. Um, we wish in terms of uh, cumulative emission reductions, we always want to be, get more of those for a lower net present value, total discounted cost between 2015 and 2050. We want to be over on this side. So that's why we think of this as the official frontier. We see for this particular model with this particular metric and this particular technology scenario, how things search out. If we keep the technology scenario and the metric, we see that in different models, these are all kind of name brand models often used in policy model. They're all over the place. So one take home is some of these um, uh, individual policies and measures get us pretty close to uh, efficient frontier. More surprisingly, some actually are underneath it. Uh, I won't go into why that is uh, in any detail, but even the most hardcore economists now understand that because the economy isn't a perfect, uh, perfectly competitive economy, uh, in, in this case has pre-existing uh, taxes on uh, many goods and services, uh, they shouldn't be so sanguine thinking that this frontier is the true and only righteous uh, solution. Uh, quickly, I'll go through um, at the global scale, 
Uh, what we were asked to do by the national and global climate negotiators is take our pre-Copenhagen round of model comparisons and put in a more complete set of technology options and more re realistic uh, policy alternatives. So this is a, uh, a kind of dense diagram that says if all supply technologies are allowed to progress in terms with the market economics included in the models with no restrictions, uh, this is the cost range you get for a, four, a 550 scenario, which is probably about 3.3 or 3.4 degrees equivalent on expected science. Here's what happens if you restrict the individual technology options. This doesn't look too bad. You're kind of under 1% of uh, discounted uh, uh, GDP um, uh, for this type of scenario. Uh, but if you go for 450, which is more like two degrees C, you get a much wider range. So this is a Worcester diagram showing the uh, kind of average value from the different models uh, for the individual scenarios. This is the full range. This is the 25 to 75% range, not a probability distribution, just a range. We also saw in this somewhat controversial that relative to the all in or all the above, uh, uh, strategy, uh, we, we uh, are particularly sensitive to not having carbon capture and sequestration or uh, biofuels. I would say this hides somewhat uh, the chapter I wrote underneath this, which showed that energy efficiency has huge benefits. And if we were a little bit more aggressive about that, we could re reduce our dependence on these uh, two technologies. And underlying this, uh, renewables are quite handy uh, in any scenario. Uh, back to uh, uh, uncertainty, a interesting, what I thought was a hokey approach is the MIT approach, which took a different version of the sequential decision-making under uncertainty and said, even for modest climate control, there are really two benefits. Uh, one is the mean temperature um, reduction is likely to be less, uh, and also the higher end of the distribution, even for modest controls. This is a 675 part per million. Nowadays, of course, we're more fearful based on the last couple of IPC assessments about this range, so we still have a lot of work to do. But if we had done what Bill Nordhaus said, we'd already have taken most of this part of the distribution off the table, but unfortunately, we haven't uh, done that. So uh, just to wrap up here, I'd like to go into future directions. I've tried to set these up. Uh, we are uh, just finishing a study on uh, uh, bi uh, biofuels with uh, carbon capture and sequestration, but better sustainability considerations, largely informed by the ecology groups, including Chris Fields' group at the Woods Institute. Uh, we are looking more closely at the juxtaposition of climate targets and sustainable development goals out of the UN. We are looking at ultra low greenhouse gas emission uh, scenarios with greatly accelerated energy efficiency. I already mentioned I'm starting a new energy modeling for study on higher electrification scenarios for North America. The idea there is you decarbonize electricity and then you electrify all the end use sectors. We are looking at more far out things like direct air capture and solar radiation management. And on methods, we're doing integrated risk analysis. Uh, we're focusing on equity. I've already said these things. My own personal project in this area is largely focused on energy, water, and land uh, dynamics. For the data scientists among you, we're now trying to think about how to combine traditional energy systems and impacts model with data science concepts. This is a plug for my own uh, project with a uh, group of 20 collaborators at different universities called a program on uh, coupled human and earth uh, sciences. And this is really for the climate impacts managers and adapters to look at the regional and sectoral scale uh, because we can't really change the climate signal too rapidly and we're struggling with hurricanes, fires and the like. So to end, here's my um, snide pushback to the people who try to put us into a narrow box and saying you're really not doing things that are good for society. It's just your crazy left wing extreme perspective that in taking this more holistic approach that we are now um, able to do more than before, but still not very perfectly, we are looking at a wide range of sustainability uh, dimensions. So that's all I had. I left uh, maybe 10, 10 minutes or a little bit more for uh, questions. So do we have any takers in the audience? I'll stop sharing at this point.
Wow, we were only supposed to have 15 people. It looks like we exceeded our audience side by 10. So that's good. <laughs> so any questions, comments on anything, policies, uh, modeling, uh, Stanford courses, majors, career paths, and so on? We, we had a question from Benjamin early on. Benjamin, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for um, this conversation. It's been really interesting. Um, my question was related to a couple of um, points you brought up across the presentation around institutional barriers and also around um, the sort of difference in capital costs for different forms of energy sources. Um, it, I remember seeing on one slide, it looked like the solar and wind infrastructure investment required significantly more sort of capital upfront as opposed to um, you know, that being balanced out by operating costs down the pipeline. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to, um, you know, what some of those barriers are that like might prevent, um, you know, either a private investor or a public utility from wanting to um, invest in that upfront capital and how you sort of get past that. Okay, so that's an interesting question, both historically and prospectively. We do have the Sustainable Finance Initiative here, which I urge you to take a look at, which does this more systematically. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, so a big problem we observed in the energy efficiency sector work is uh, most consumers don't have easy access to capital. So they are, uh, this is called the first cost aversion. So this means you don't want to put 15 or 20K down for a solar array on your roof because you're feeling like you don't have uh, easy access to capital markets. Now, there are two things you can do. One is the institutional one. You can have a third party come in like for solar and basically say, well, if that's a problem, we will take care of it for you. We can pool your um, uh, interest together, we can take title to the solar arrays on this. So this was alongside the technology advance, a huge stimulus for, uh, for solar. So the way that worked is they said, we will offer you a reduction in the cost the traditional utility would cause, would uh, charge you for electricity. And you won't have to either pay that upfront cost because we'll pay it for you and essentially charge you a favorable financing rate to recoup that and still keep you under the utility rates. So that was a major step forward. But at a bigger, uh, more systemic level, once you get out of households, uh, the same kind of things impact uh, industrial consumers in the industry and power sector. And that's really where the sustainable finance initiative is focusing on. A flaw with the models which we're trying to work on is many of those assume that this capital recovery factor is the same for all technologies in all regions. So even, this is a kind of institutional behavior thing, even corporations fear that an untested technology will look good and then it won't work out as planned for various reasons I don't have time to get into and they'll be left holding the bag. So there's a lot of work now uh, and uh, I just talked conveniently to Tom Heller, the leader of the um, Sustainable Finance Initiative. Uh, he, and I'm trying to do this from the modeling side, but he's out there at the front lines working with Wall Street, but also uh, the, the uh, development banks in China, India, Brazil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this plays out differently in every world region. So where we ended up, which I'm trying to get the modeling people to do, is you have to be very specific about which acts for you finance people, which assets you're talking about and whose portfolios you're trying to manage. He's come up with a problem at the sovereign level, at the country level, is if you go for one of these aggressive, this is a new problem, uh, which does provide an institutional constraint. If you buy the story that we need to go heavy renewables and you set up uh, the system so that your uh, investors in your domain can do that and the whole thing craters, we get kind of a um, big short scenario in the real estate market. Uh, they're left holding the bag and get blamed for all that. So there's this kind of reverse thing. Now, just identifying that as an issue and a constraint doesn't mean that there aren't creative ways to work around that. And that's where a lot of the attention on the finance side is going right now. So that was a great question. Thanks. 
And Thank you very much. We have a quick question here. Are the EMF 33 and 37 labels, are those labs or classes? Uh, no, believe it or not, this will make me seem very old. They're the number of the studies we've done. So I was a grad student during EMF1. We've now done, uh, we're starting on our 37th model in our comparison project. Um, we did EMF 34 on ne uh, North American energy integration. Because of the current political situation, I parked uh, 35 uh, and 36 in Japan and uh, Europe, and they are doing uh, Asian region to global scenarios in the uh, Japan instance and sustainability scenarios and trade scenarios in the uh, European thing. So that in fact, the German and Japanese governments are paying for that and barring our uh, copyright. It just means I have to get up early in the morning and participate in their steering committee uh, events. So it is literally uh, EMF 37 is our 37th uh, energy modeling forum study, believe it or not. Great. Um, and we have a question from Mayank. Mayank, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Great. Thank, thank you very much for the uh, lecture, Professor. Very, uh, very uh, encompassing of a broad topic. Um, you touched on some of the behavioral constraints that um, can impact modeling and how um, how we should be looking at problems to um, that we face. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how um, behavioral economics and modeling of that comes into play in potentially climate change, but also in the energy sector, for example, in terms of um, grid balancing when energy sources are becoming more distributed uh, in nature uh, as we go forward with renewables? Um, or behavioral economics in terms of how people make decisions in the face of uncertainty when um, they're basically trying to figure out, for example, I don't know, um, what level to set um, carbon taxes on or, or how to set variable tariffs for uh, renewable energy supply, that kind of thing. Yeah, there, uh, this is a very hot research topic and there are many uh, students at all levels from freshmen to vet to graduating PhD students working on this. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, all the top economics departments said behavior is a second order effect, but you're not gonna waste faculty slots on behavioral economics now. Everyone wants to hire their third or fourth one. I would say a personal story, Amy Levins and I came up about the same time. And in my thesis, I promoted energy efficiency as our first best solution to some of these same issues, which existed in a different form back then. Uh, he was more promotional about that, so he's much more famous than I am. And I think the thing that Amory and I both missed, I already alluded to, is we thought once the information, we, we understood the information, it would be easy to transfer it to normal people and they would act accordingly. Behavioral economics came in and said, not so fast, uh, you really need to think about who these people are and what their ability to uh, you know, take in information and uh, use it to uh, decide on even what's best for them in terms of their objectives, let alone uh, societal objectives. So that leads to a bunch of constraints and opportunity that don't work in the, within the price system. These are generically known in behavioral economics as behavioral nudges. So these would be information programs. We will make the information more accessible. And my personal favorite, uh, demonstration programs. We will subsidize people heavily to go out in your neighborhood or in your utility region to actually do these things, including your home utility. We'll just over-subsidize them so they don't even have to think about doing it. They will do it and therefore demonstrate uh, that it can be done and how it can be done. I would say mm -hmm. when most consumers and even utilities uh, uh, consumers, industrial con if the, if the government says to do something, they don't necessarily believe that it's gonna work out so well. And if the regulators say, they may even be more um, uh, suspicious of that. But if you actually constrain, uh, uh, subsidize demonstration projects on the ground, they can do that. So I'm seeing that more and more. Now you kind of did a fast one because if you go from the consumer level, either in the industry or consumer into grid operations, you have a whole nother set of issues, like I mentioned demand response, my most advanced PhD student is working on demand response. That's getting people used to bidding into the market. When you get the deck curve in the afternoon, can we pay you a subsidy in terms of lower overall rates? 
for the right to turn you off, you know, turn your refrigerator off for one hour, but not two, or turn off your uh, AC remotely or uh, upon issuing an instruction. So I think that's where a lot of the action is now that you'll see around uh, bits, bits and watts and storage X and so on, two of the big initiatives going on. Thank you. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, bits and watts did a, has been doing a digital grid webinar series and the last one in that series was on transactive energy, which is very interesting. You can find the recording of that on our website. Yeah, and I believe well, Gila actually runs the seminar series. Is that correct? I do. I run the, the yeah. yeah. Smart so you have an expert on what they've done. You, the website is great, but you could even contact with Gila. I'm sure she would uh, be uh, willing to tell you who's talked and who they have uh, uh, in the in the on the drawing boards now for future seminars. Yeah. I, for those of you who don't know, I'm the program manager for the Bits and Watts initiative. All right, we've got another question from Kwasim. Kwasim, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? And just time check, we have seven minutes left. So let's try to be concise. Sure, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Professor. Um, I just wanted to ask you, towards the end, you alluded to uh, efforts underway to integrate data science and, uh, techniques to uh, systems modeling. Um, could you please explain a little bit about like what some of these efforts look like? Okay, so I'll give you my own personal take on that, which is one of many probably. Um, it really is, uh, so historically, the energy environmental modeling community has been very structure oriented. So as I presented a lot of work on structural models, much less data driven. I actually have talked to the people who do cancer modeling and they're almost exclusively natural history data driven in that level. Uh, I wrote as early as 15 years ago that it was good that we were using these first structural principles, but we were not updating even our initial conditions uh, uh, rapidly enough. So the state of play right now is to try to take advantage of both sides as we have more proliferous, more disaggregated, sensor driven data sources that we didn't have before. And so my, and some people think that that's all you need. Now at the operational level, like grid stability, uh, what's called unit commitment modeling, even capacity planning model, you could see substituting a pure data science machine learning type approach for a more structural model. But I would argue as you go out, you get structural shifts that make it harder to detect structure because it's not evident in the historical uh, data sets. It's my own personal view. I've used the same argument historically for econometricians who don't want to put much structural change prospectively in there. Personally, and you could probably already tell this, I think the way forward lies in the interregnum between the two. So I call this data simulation. We ought to get, and I'm working with a group at the National Renewable Energy Lab who has a big data science group and some of the best traditional utility modeling people, and they're trying to bring those uh, together. And I'm trying to get a little research group with, uh, with uh, one of the people, Wahila works with, Leong Min and the directors, and some of our local alumni, some of which I've worked with uh, uh, over many years at places like DeepMind. You may not know, there's, remember DeepMind, the company based in the UK that beat the Go Masters, and now the big online computer games. They actually have a division of, uh, run by one of our uh, alumni uh, in Mountain View. It's called DeepMind Energy. So we're trying to get the data science people at Stanford, DeepMind, and NREL to compare notes. Lots of NDAs and non-disclosures, but I think a lot of interests are Andrew Ng-ish on the Stanford side trying to do public good work. So if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to talk uh, further about it. I do feel uh, like we uh, stand to gain the most, again, uh, by constructing hybrid architectures, which takes advantage of the relative strengths of the data science approach and the structural approach and avoids the limitations of bo on both sides. Right. Thanks, Thank you for John. that wonderful answer. I will definitely reach out to you. From John Foy. John, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? And yeah. then couple questions in the chat. We're going to run out of time, but I've saved those questions. I'll give them to John and let him give you feedback at a later point. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you both for the, for the talk and the presentation. Um, mine might be quick. Um, 
If I had a process question, so if you have a particular area of interest or a question on uh, work that's been done to date, what's the best way to do that? Um, Okay, I'll, I'll do this in two parts. Uh, we do have a new program under Diana Gregg. I don't know if they met Diana, which is supposed to be providing resources on who's doing what and what courses are available. Diana was uh, pleasingly for me a postdoc with us in the Precord Energy Efficiency Center and now runs the energy resources course thing. So she has a project. I would say if you want more information on energy systems model uh, or so-called integrated assessment models, the global Kind of different types. I would uh, I would uh, nominate me because that's what I'm most known for. So I actually I didn't have time to talk about this. Run uh, for now 14 years, a consortium of almost 60 global modeling centers where we try to coordinate amongst the different regions and different disciplines the global scale work. And the Peaches project that I mentioned is a US DOE thing. Uh, one of four multi-sector dynamic uh, projects that are kind of state of the art-ish. There are a few other people I can uh, tell you about, but I'm probably at this point, one of the best uh, people to consult about who's doing what type of work. I do lean on people like Wahila and Leong and the other uh, uh, kind of uh, initiative directors and the Precord and Woods directors to keep me more or less up to date, but. It's so, you know, I would say 20 years ago, I actually have a talk on this. Jim Sweeney and I and a few other people knew everything about what everybody was doing. And now that's even impossible for the pre and Woods directors. So we need to work as a, as a, as a team. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, John. I'd say the good news and the bad news is that people are working on these problems in a vast array of universities and companies. And so the work is being done in lots of different places and that's good news and it's bad news because we don't always know what everybody else is doing. Yeah, I, I've made that point even on, even on campus. In, the, in, the, in, in California, it gets harder. In the US, it gets harder. So my, my pitch in this, I actually talked about this uh, pre-court advisory board meeting and this is my first, believe it or not, my first priority. We could do bigger stuff together if we just had better communication. We don't want top down. This is not, it would be antithetical to Stanford to have a lot of top down direction, but there's a huge benefit in the kind of work you all are interested in and knowing what each other is doing because we'll organically, this is very Silicon Valley ish, I know, it will organically, you guys, if you see that, will say, oh, there's a huge gap here. I'll start a company or a new research program, get a PhD, get an MBA. Uh, go to law school. You know, we have great examples of all the above. I am on the EIPER uh, exec comm, so any of you people who are in MBA joint program, uh, I'm actually helping run their uh, capstone class this uh, this quarter, in fact. All right. Well, thank, thank you so much, John. Let's uh, give John a hand. Thank you so much for your, for sharing your masterful knowledge with us today. And uh, all of you students, I'm supposed to remind you to go off to your En-ROADS team meetings now. And uh, John, also, you are going to help out with the En-ROADS team. I'll drop by, yeah. yeah and, 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 uh, apropos of the times, let me end with my, uh, my people have probably figured out my background. So I, this is for you guys to uh, go and do, do the uh, vibranium equivalent magic uh, out there in the real world. Thanks.